So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, as the as the waiting room empties and the auditorium fills up, let me uh, welcome you to this AI for People conversation around certification and in assurance. It's not the first, it's the second of these conversations because assurance for AI is crucial and it's complicated. Uh, this afternoon, you have uh, a really expert panel uh, coming up. I'm not going to introduce everybody at this stage. I'll do it as I go along. Let me introduce myself. I'm Robert Madeline. I uh, used to work on AI stuff in the Commission, and since a couple of years, I support Atomium and uh, the Scientific Committee of AI for People in its work. And I'm very pleased to have been asked to moderate this session. But uh, I am not an expert, so the audience, as well as the speakers, are encouraged to uh, convince the lay public as well as the insiders. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to pass the floor to Professor Chatilla. Raja Chatilla and I have worked on AI for People for some years, and he is the moving spirit behind these conversations. Raja, you have the floor. Thank you, Robert. Hello, everyone. Uh, well, um, <clears throat> uh, it's, it's really um, a pleasure to welcome you today uh, on this second conversation of uh, AI for people on, uh, and this one is on certification and assurance. We are actually addressing several issues uh, in several conversations that are very relevant to the AI Act and uh, beyond the AI Act to the development of AI systems in general so uh, in the uh, first conversation, we had with us uh, Sarah Speakerman. Uh, Sarah Speakerman, uh, who is the chair of the Institute of IS and Society in Vienna University of Economics and Business, uh, gave us a, uh, an overview of a new standard that was issued in uh, 2021. It's an IEEE standard from the P7000 series. And I believe Konstantinos will uh, speak about uh, this series. Uh, these are, I would say, ethical or techno-ethical standards. Uh, there are uh, 15 of them uh, under development uh, now, and uh, this one has been published uh, last year, which specifically uh, presents a model process for addressing ethical concerns during system design. Uh, it's uh, a way to develop AI systems that are compliant with ethical concerns and uh, taking into account a, for example, a ba value-based design approach. Now, in the AI Act, uh, standards play uh, a very important role, but another thing that plays an important role, it's certification. Certification and standards are connected, of course. Uh, and <clears throat> this is why after presenting this uh, standard uh, uh, last time. Uh, today, we are focusing on a certification, uh, on the certification issue. And we have with us several uh, contributors to this uh, um, issue uh, from industry. Uh, again, Robert will present each, uh, each speaker, but we have people from industry. We have people from uh, an international professional organization, the IEEE, who has been working on those issues since many years now and uh, which develop, uh, uh, developed also an, uh, a framework for uh, ethical, and I prefer to say techno-ethical because of course it's not just ethics, it's also the technology itself that is used, uh, uh, techno-ethical certification, and this has been actually experimented. So it's very important to have some uh, lesson learned from this uh, um, uh, experience and, uh, and uh, how, how the, uh, result can be uh, important uh, uh, to, to the whole process. So uh, the CE marking, uh, which is um, uh, required in the uh, AI Act for um, high-risk systems, is uh, something that is yet to be defined. And uh, this conversation actually is here to help us frame the issues to understand what would be such uh, a certification who would be uh, able to provide this certification? Who, who certifies the certifiers, uh, if I may say so? Uh, uh, it's a, a very uh, um, 
important and overreaching uh, issue that we are going to discuss today with uh, our uh, speakers. Um, and um, I would like also to say one word about uh, uh, the international prospects. We have with us uh, uh, speakers from Europe, from uh, uh, the uh, international organizations, and this is uh, not just a European issue, of course. Uh, and the international uh, visions may differ, but when we look at the concrete work that is going on in, in different uh, countries, we notice some convergence. For example, uh, and, 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 and certainly this will be also raised later, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the United States, issued uh, four, uh, six days ago, on March 17, uh, a, uh, a document which is specifically uh, about uh, uh, risk assessment. Uh, and, and this is now uh, undergoing uh, discussions uh, to, be, to, be, uh, to have uh, some feedback uh, from different uh, stakeholders. So you can see that there is a convergence about this risk issue, this risk-based approach, how we address risk, how can we certify uh, a system uh, from this standpoint. So without uh, taking too much of your time, myself, let's get to the meat actually, and handing back the mic to Robert. Thank you very much. Roger, thanks for that. I think that's, uh, that helpfully positions us and we are looking at a cooperative uh, solution to global problems. So absolutely right. Um, we, we are hoping to hear in the course of our discussions from Eva Kaili, who's the European Parliament Vice President and the Chair of the Science and Technology Panel there. Eva told us before we started that she would be a bit late joining and I see she hasn't yet joined us. So I suggest that we uh, bring Eva in when she uh, can join us. And I would therefore like to pass the floor for the first substantive presentation to Paul Donga. Uh, Paul is a researcher in AI and ethics at Fujitsu Research here in Europe. So Paul, you have the floor. Robert, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I'm just going to share a short presentation. Please let me know when it is visible. It's visible. Excellent. Great. Thank you very much. So um, I'd just like to spend a few minutes really talking about certif certification and assurance, uh, really from a, from a Fujitsu perspective. Um, so currently there are several ethical AI principles and requirements at various stages of maturity and detail. And four notable examples are here on the slide. The EU's ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI published in 2019 established somewhat minimal criteria for a system to be described as trustworthy. The OECD published its five principles for the stewardship of AI and recommendations for governments to foster those principles through policy initiatives. And, and AI for People laid out its global frameworks in 2021, covering seven industries, each framework designed specifically to cater for the needs of its industry. And of course, in 2019, um, the IEEE set out its scientific analysis and high level recommendations through ethically aligned design principles and developed the, the IEEE suite 7000 to 7021 series of standards. And, and when it comes to enacting certification, it, the, the IEEE process, which we're going to hear more about in this conversation, has provided a comprehensive process for ensuring compliance through its value-based engineering approach. One which identifies end user values early on in the system development cycle and provides for appropriate risk mitigants, in effect, designing out risk to human values very early on. Um, and, and really that, from our perspective, brings us to the number of this slide, which is, which is how can Fujitsu help AI for people in progressive its thinking about certification for, for other principles that are yet to, aren't yet covered through a certification process. And, and those that I mentioned at the beginning of this slide uh, and, and what action should we prioritize and what role can Fujitsu play in that process and in that conversation with AI for people, bringing in the myriad of different sort of principles and guidelines around ethics uh, and providing a, a flexible approach. So, so, so that's, that's kind of one of our questions that we're asking ourselves as well. Um, and how, and, and we believe 
Fujitsu has really created a, a first step towards a, a flexible certification um, process, uh, which brings me to the, to, to the next slide, really. Um, Fujitsu's AI ethical impact assessment. So we believe that enabling a smooth certification process, a technical solution in the form of a, of a service offering would be beneficial. So Fujitsu's AI ethical impact assessment, AIEIA, is our first step towards such a service offering. Um, so, so, so what is it? Um, in summary, it's a method for systematically analyzing ethical risks that may occur in AI systems based on guidelines. In this method, AI ethics guidelines are embedded, embodied into check items and AI systems are analyzed to identify potential ethical problems as risks. So it's a risk-based approach. Currently, we've launched this based on the EU ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI. Uh, and and the, the, the assessment is, is really a self-assessment. So it's, for, it's up to firms to conduct this on their own systems. In the, in, in the main body of the slide, starting on, on, on the left, I'll just talk for a minute about, I guess, the process. Um, the, the first step in the impact assessment is to create a system diagram. And the system diagram really identifies and describes the relationships among the AI system components and its stakeholders. These are called interactions. We then have an, an AI ethics model, which is a structured decomposition of, of one set of AI ethics guidelines. And, and we've actually set, set this up already, an ethics model for the, the EU ethics guidelines. Each interaction is identified and a correspondence table is used to identify possible AI ethical risks resulting from that interaction. And based on the use case of the AI system being analyzed, a situation that violates an applicable AI ethical characteristic is classed as a specific risk scene. And that gives rise to an impact assessment result. And this is captured in a system diagram as well that summarizes the risks that have been identified. Risks are divided into risk events that appear as interactions with stakeholders and risk factors which cause those risk events. So, so rather than giving a very detailed description of each, and that's a, that's a really high level overview of the step-by-step -step process. In order to valid, validate this, we trialed it on 15 incidents in the Partnership on AI's incident database. The database contains famous AI ethical incidents and violations. And we correct, correctly identified a number of ethical risks in each of the 15 incidents that we selected to, to trial our methodology on, uh, which we believe is a, is a very positive result. So I think the key point I try to get across in this is we've taken a first step. We believe it's a structured approach. Um, we believe we, it's flexible enough to allow us to look at principles that are varied and not just principles from one particular organization. Um, and, and, and as we've just launched this, we're open to suggestions for improvements uh, through conversations like this. Moving on to uh, 2022 and beyond. So we're discussing a number of ways in which we can evolve our ethics impact assessment. One of those questions is how do we make this operational? Uh, and really that's concerned with effective deployment. So what, what guidelines do we set for the effective implementation of this approach within a technology organization? When do you first apply it? During system design, development and test or initial deployment or in the requirements capture phase? Who is responsible and accountable for keeping the assessment accurate and more importantly, up to date? As AI systems evolve over time, when and how frequently should this be applied? And how is change control managed? Uh, how should an organization set it itself up from a governance perspective to implement this effectively? And from a quality assurance perspective, what's the role of the AI provider's internal audit department with regards to independently verifying the assessment? We're also looking at how we iteratively mature and validate this approach. As I said before, this is the initial launch and we expect to continue to mature the methodology over time. How and when is that done it still remains to be decided upon and, and is the subject of ongoing planning. Technology implementation. Well, there's, there's ample scope to automate the methodology into a tool set and that's something we're actively looking at. And this involves not just rolling out the ethical risk assessment methodology, but to extend it into a number of areas. So this is to do things like incorporate scoring to maybe quantify self-assessment results in more detail, to provide management information reporting, 
to provide change control with dedicated user roles and responsibilities. So from a tool, a tool set perspective, technology implementation is probably one of the strongest themes that we're seeing coming up. Uh, and then we're talking about generalizing it to alternative ethical principles. So the intention is for the approach to be flexible enough to cater for various principles. And we strongly believe that we should continue to follow that theme. Uh, and indeed, how do we allow for, for regional variation? I mean, as, a, as, a, as, a, as Fujitsu Technologies, we, we are global, uh, but we have a strong footprint in, in, in different regions. So how do we provide for regional variation? And finally, uh, to investigate the alignment to legislative requirements. So what do we have to do to progress this, uh, to align it with the, with the Draft AI Act? So this is something that we, we've just started thinking about, but is also a pressing concern. Um, just want to emphasize, please be aware that these are all options that are under review and they are subject to planning and prioritization. And we're not at this stage able to commit to, to which one of these are being done and which is the highest priority. Uh, just a, a one slide on shameless self-promotion. Um, Fujitsu remains committed to AI ethics. We continue to ensure that AI ethics remains a key priority. Um, starting at the bottom of the slide in, in March 2019, we formulated our group AI commitment to create greater value for customers and society while honoring its promise or our promise to deliver safe, secure and transparent AI technology. And this included things like provide value to customers and society with AI, to strive for human centric AI, uh, for sustainable society using AI and strive for an AI that respects and supports people's decision making. Um, and as corporate social responsibility, to emphasize transparency and accountability at every stage. So building and maintaining trust remains central to all of Fujitsu's business activities. And that really forms the basis for Fujitsu's purpose, which is to make the world more sustainable by building trust in society through innovation. In the middle of the slide in, in, in January of this year, we announced a decision to establish a new organization to strengthen our governance of AI ethics. So we established the AI Ethics and Governance Office um, to accelerate you know, safe and secure deployment of AI technologies. Um, this department reports directly to our CEO, Takita San, and really marks the next step in Fujitsu's ongoing efforts to strengthen and enforce comprehensive and company-wide measures on AI ethics as well as governance. Um, the new office will focus on implementing measures to effectively promote ethics related to research, development, and implementation of advanced technologies. And, and finally, just to wrap up, uh, as mentioned on the previous slide, on February the 21st, we, we formally announced the AI ethics impact assessment, which, which I've just talked about, um, and we'll be offering the resources under that uh, free of charge uh, with pretty much immediate effect. Um, so that's just you know, our view on how we remain committed to AI ethics at the, at the highest of standards. And on that note, that, that, that finishes me off. And uh, Robert, back to you. I hope I'm just inside the 10 minutes. No, oh, perfect. Thanks very much, Paul. And I, I well remember uh, Fujitsu in the context of AI for People being a very early mover back in 2019 with a board level vision. And now in a way you're, you're, you're confirming with your decision of January, setting up the office under the CEO that actually having a strong commitment at the top is part of navigating through these innovative uh, waters. The other point I think is very interesting is the sort of free for use, open to networking message, because as we all feel our way forward, and maybe uh, Salvatore Escalza from the Commission can comment on this going forward, it's important that the sort of leading actors are all reinforcing each other so that we develop as quickly as possible a, a genuine best practice. So great, very good. Um, I think our legislator Eva is still delayed in her legislative work. So I'll now pass the floor to Salvatore Scalzo, who um, I have the pleasure to introduce as a, as a current member of my old DG dealing with these things. Salvatore, you have the floor. Thanks a lot, and thanks a lot really for the kind invitation to attend this panel. 
Uh, I will try to provide, uh, without taking anything for granted, let's say the most uh, relevant elements uh, from the AI Act for this discussion. So I will share my screen. So hopefully you should be in a position to see the presentation. Can you see it? Yes, um, thank you. Fantastic. Okay, so um, I will run quickly, uh, also for the sake of time, uh, through a number of slides, just with the essential elements. Uh, the first thing, and just to link also to what has been said in the introduction, indeed, uh, when drafting the AI Act, we wanted to rely on the well-consolidated internal market rules within the EU. So internal market rules, and in particular, the le new legislative framework, which underpins the way the most of the products today are regulated. Think of medical devices, machinery, toys, just to make some examples. We try to follow that same regulatory model and therefore what is also well known and see as CE marking system. A second important general element, and I will also have a slide on that, is that we try to be extremely targeted. So to take a risk-based approach to ensure that the measures laid down in the AI Act will be proportionate to the risks that the AI systems present. And a third important thing, but I will make also later some consideration on the most, uh, on certain international aspects, uh, it is important to highlight that the, uh, we uh, want to create a level playing field for EU and non-EU players, meaning that the rules shall be applicable in the same manner, regardless of the location of the operator in question. That said, uh, I think it is important before moving forward to requirements and certification aspects, uh, and uh, just to say that we, we had to confront with a difficult challenge to define AI, but of course the definition of AI is paramount to the, let's say, to the understanding of the scope of this regulation. In that sense, we wanted to rely as much as possible on a definition agreed with the like-minded partners, and therefore we built on the OECD definition of AI with the aim to cover all AI, including traditional symbolic AI, machine learning, and hybrid systems. And the technique and approaches of AI, which are under the scope, are listed in our Annex 1 to the regulation, also to increase the legal certainty. When I talked about the risk-based approach here, you can see in these slides the four risk categories that we identified. I do not want to go into the details at this stage, but just to say that this pyramid moves from the highest risk category, which is basically the uh, situation of certain unacceptable practices which contravene EU values and should be prohibited, up to the large majority, the green layer, the large majority of AI systems on the market for which no requirements would apply. So for which the situation would significantly, I would say substantially continue the current situation will continue to exist without any further rules. In reality, the core of this regulation applies to what we define as a second layer here, the high-risk AI systems, which we estimate to be between 5 and 10 percent of the AI applications market. And for these systems, as I will explain later, uh, there would be certain criteria and certain requirements to be complied with before they are placed on the market or put into service. And in fact, let's move now to these high-risk AI systems. What is a high-risk AI system under the regulation? We identify two criteria. We try to be as exhaustive and, and precise as possible, also to, of course, the benefit of legal certainty. We have, first of all, safety components of regulated products. And we say, and we lay down in particular, that uh, a safety component of a regulated product shall be high-risk if that product is subject to third party assessment under the sectorial legislation in question. So we wanted to create a, a virtuous link between uh, our risk assessment for the safe component and the safe assessment or, and the risk assessment of the product under the sectorial legislation. And then we have a second category of high risk AI systems, which are defined in an exhaustive manner in our Annex 3 and pertain to a certain number of areas. I would say in a nutshell that this second category concerns what we call standalone AI systems. So AI systems which are not related to product to products and have primarily fundamental rights implications. Think of systems used for biometric identification or for educational and vocational training or to filter, for example, job applications. 
Now, if a system is high risk, that means that it has to comply with certain requirements, like NLF legislation, so internal market legislation for products, these requirements are spelled out as high level technical objectives in the text of the act. They concern aspects related to data quality, technical documentation, transparency, human oversight, accuracy, robustness, and cybersecurity. And we also expect the provider of a risk A system to establish and implement a risk management system. Uh, as one which is actually one of the requirements in our article 9. Uh, here I want also to offer, let's say, uh, to offer a quick view of what the life cycle of the system is about and also how we position the certification process. Because as you can see, you have to comply with certain requirements. We rely on harmonized standards because the requirements in the regulation are set in the form of high level technical objectives, and we expect standards to lay down the technical solutions that uh, that serve uh, the, 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 that can be used also for the purpose of demonstrating the compliance with the requirements of uh, of the framework. Then uh, the, this demonstration of compliance would take the form of a conformity assessment procedure, as you can see clearly in the left hand side of this slide, which is uh, a procedure through which the demonstration should be carried out by the provider. This can take the form of a self assessment, like in the most of our category of standalone AI systems. So, in the bottom part, of this slide, you can see that basically for standalone systems, which have a primarily fundamental right implications, we foresee a self-assessment, at least at the beginning, because, of, because this assessment may be upgraded as a result of new evidence. But from the beginning, we will start with the self-assessment with the exception of the remote biometric identification, will, which will be subject to a third party assessment involving a notified body, the, a certification body, we call them notified body within the EU, which are designated and monitored by member states. With regard to the first category, the, first, the safety components of products, as you can see, in order to avoid the duplication, we want to rely on the conformity assessment procedure as set under the relevant product legislation. So in order to have one unique conformity assessment that would also look at the requirements of the AI Act. I don't want to go into the details, but just to say that in the post-market phase, uh, we have uh, obligations because AI is a lot about the life cycle, is an evolving product by definition. And therefore we have a set of obligations for the different operators and also for the authorities in the post-market phase. Let me just mention one thing, which is I think one of the most controversial and uh, complex aspects of our framework, the need to confront with the life cycle of an AI system which continue to learn after deployment. Here, we found that the traditional concept of uh, uh, conformity assessment and substantial modification triggering a new conformity assessment would not exactly apply in those cases because otherwise you would have operators being obliged to undergo multiple conformity assessment and on a regular basis. So we decided there, based also on reflection done at the US level in the FDA, to try to implement a new concept of a predefined change protocol. So to say that any change which is documented and uh, whose uh, technical solutions are validated at the moment of the initial conformity assessment would not be considered substantial modification and would not trigger a new conformity assessment. So this is for us a kind of new concept and solution to make sure that we can target appropriately the situation of AI system which would continue to learn after deployment. A a Another important question, and I will conclude on that, another important issue is the timelines. This is a complex new systems, notably because we have some experience with new technologies in products like medical devices and machinery. But as you can see, we also cover high risk systems which belong to unregulated and notably fundamental right related areas. So we think that an appropriate transitional period is needed. Uh, we set a two year transitional period from the entry into force. It is clear that to determine this period, uh, 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 we will have to see when the co-legislator will agree 
uh, on, on a final text. At the moment, uh, the proposal of April 2021 is a commission's proposal, which is at the moment in the course of being negotiated by the two co-legislators. We don't have a crystal ball, clearly, to determine when exactly the agreement will take place, but we can say provisionally that we may expect reasonably the final text to be adopted in the first semester of 2023, and therefore the application date to be in the first sem semester of 2025. As we rely on harmonized standards, uh, the standards would have to be elaborated in parallel with this process because we would, have, we would need harmonized standards to be ready before the application date. And the Commission is trying to speed up and to engage with the standardization organization to ensure that they can start and continue in many cases their work as soon as possible. We are actually even already preparing the first mandate to the European standardization organizations to produce these standards, and that will come even before the adoption of the AI Act. Let me, a final note is the, on, on the international dimension of standards. You know that our harmonized standard systems is based on standards which are submitted by European standardization organizations. But, and here an important note, this does not mean that international standards are disregarded in the EU system. Actually not, because there are agreements in place between the European and international standardization organization to ensure that international work can be fully used at the European level. And let me add also that we have been in touch and will continue to be in touch also with the important organizations like IEEE to make sure that we can also make use of their work at the EU level. So we really look at uh, international standardization with an extremely positive and open spirit. And uh, we want to rely as much as possible on international standards because it is important for trade also and for making sure that the, 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 the EU standards can align with those of like-minded partners. I would close there. And of course, I will be happy then later on to reply to questions. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Salvatore. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions because, as you say, getting all this done is going to be complex and a busy process. Uh, thanks for that, then. Um, can I ask, Michaela, have, have we seen our friend Ava join? Michaela? She was shortly in and then she left again. So I'm trying to see uh, okay. if I can contact It's okay, we, we go on. Then I'd like to pass the floor to Dr. Caracalios, the Managing Director of IEEE Standards. And this will introduce a, uh, a three-part uh, presentation, also by his colleagues, uh, Ali Hassami and Clara Nepo. So Konstantinos, thank you, you have the floor. Thank you, Robert. Uh, so it is a great pleasure to be here together with you and uh, also to uh, have uh, the honor to introduce uh, Ali and uh, Clara to present um, what IEEE has been doing in this area and I would like to say a few words why. Uh, for us, it is not just about AI systems, it is a broader effort that we're undertaking through one of the major influ influencing factors in the global techno-scientific communities, which is IEEE, what we're trying to do is uh, to practically assume our share of responsibility for the systems uh, that we are producing. And we, it is not the organization, it is really the people who are really around us, as millions of engineers and scientists really who really are inspired and build their imaginary around uh, our common practices, the peer dynamics and so on. It's a very interesting ecosystem. So, and we believe it is uh, that these systems that are emerging and the AI systems are part of uh, the story are not just technical anymore. We saw this years ago and, and we call them socio-technical systems. And uh, we started acting upon them in two ways. First, changing the narrative. And the predominant narrative, and it still is worldwide, is that engineers have nothing to do with these uh, aspects. We're just solving technical problems. I mean, the circle of people who are here apparently don't believe this, uh, but we should not really have the illusion that we're the majority out there. 
And this is something we have to work together to change this. Because with this, uh, let's say, concept in mind, uh, we are going to produce more problems than we we'll ever be able to solve. The second is once we have built enough momentum, uh, then what should we do? And uh, it has been already presented. It is uh, at our level, we have done three things. Four, the one thing is uh, we, let's say, build the story. And this is the ethically aligned design. This is the story, this is the big story. And of course we built an ecosystem and this was led by Raza Shatila. He was the first leader and he's still the leader of our uh, vast ecosystem which really deals with these things. Secondly, we pose the question in a way that we can act upon them. And for us being engineers and being also standard setters is uh, to give instructions to our colleagues how to do a better job, practical instructions. These are standards, recommendations, guides, certification schemes. So we invested a, a huge amount of energy and time there because it is not just about talking. So this is why we are able to deliver now. In the moment you are discussing, we have already assets like the egg pies or certified and the, some of the 7,000 standards are already finished and the, most of them are going to be finished this year. So because we started years ago, and not only we started, practically through the leadership of Raja and other people like him, we created this space. And this is not a marketing space. For us, this is a, the starting point for a paradigm change within the techno-scientific communities, that we are there as community, not as individuals, eh? with our collectives, it's our associations, our organizations, and we say yes, we care and we're going to deal with the problems that cre are created through technology and can be solved through technology, like global warming or uh, the platforms of the internet that are destroying democracy and also making our uh, children uh, addicted. We bear responsibility for this. We cannot say it is others doing this. So this is what it's about. And uh, we're very pleased to see because when we started, we were quite lonely, I must say. Now, there is a huge momentum, and we see this also in the panel today. And uh, the, one of the most interesting tools, and I will not say more than the title here, is uh, really systems we have built, which are, have the capacity to assess the quality of algorithmic decision-making systems uh, with respect to uh, several high-level criteria and uh, which are very important and which appear in almost all uh, lists like transparency, reduction of bias, uh, degree of accountability and uh, respect of our uh, privacy and so on. And uh, what is very important, the work we have done is not, let's say, just a checking list, it is very thorough. For each one of these, we have uh, defined hundreds of measurable criteria. And of course, not everything needs to be applied everywhere. Eh? We have uh, also methods of how to reduce the numbers of how to assess the profile before we start the certification and so on. Eh? And uh, so this is very thorough, very practical because it goes down to the to the component of the system and the, it can be designed differently and so on. And uh, just a, a closing comment, I'm not going to use all my time here because uh, my, I prefer to, leave, to give the rest of my time to Ali to explain more details. Uh, there is, a, it was a very interesting presentation by uh, the gentleman from uh, Fujitsu and it is true that Fujitsu has started very early uh, taking care of this. And uh, in slide two, he had the, uh, the interactions between the different systems and so on. I just wanted to say that uh, our system is not self-contained, that uh, the ECPI is certified. That means it is possible that other organizations do the certification 
that is done with the assessment eh, with the tools we can provide for assessment we are, do not uh, want to do the certification ourselves we can do it we have certification uh, procedure but we prefer that others are doing so there is a role separation there and we regard IEEE to be the, let's say, the developer and the maintainer or the guardian of this set of specifications. This is sufficient for IEEE. And there is enough work then for all others to do. And um, I see that uh, the Vice President of the European Parliament has joined and uh, probably it is her turn to speak now, Robert. Indeed, so Konstantinos, thank you very much for that, which I think gives us an inspiringly clear picture of what IEEE really does, that sort of global uh, engineering diplomacy. And I would, as you uh, hint, like now to uh, pass the floor to Eva Kaili, who, despite having ever more work to do, Eva, you've been a, a faithful supporter of and contributor to AI for People. So we're really pleased that you could uh, use it in for this session as well. And Eva, you have a Thank you, Robert. Yes, we, we actually remember working together from the beginning of the AI for People and uh, when the um, maybe the timing didn't appear to be so, so um, important, but then I think the pandemic accelerated everything and we understood how digitalization is transforming our lives and uh, furthermore, of course, AI. So um, thank you. And um, I'd like to thank also Michelangelo, Michelle Robato and uh, and also Costadinos Carajalos, that after him, uh, it's very difficult um, to uh, say anything useful and contribute to your discussion. Uh, so I will try to focus a bit on what uh, uh, we're doing here in the European uh, Union and Parliament, because um, I think now we have in our hands basically the AI Act, and uh, um, it's the first ever legal framework uh, for AI. I remember in 2019, I was like working on the uh, calling for uh, regulation and ethical framework, and now it's materializing finally. Um, and uh, it aims, as, as uh, you have said, to ensure the development, deployment, and uh, uptake of a trustworthy and human centric AI in, uh, in the EU, hopefully, with the um, ambition to extend and expand this, this influence of respect to our um, uh, shared values and, uh, and rights and protection of. of uh, of our quality of life and try also to um, ensure that even with non-like-minded countries, we will find the minimum standards of uh, collaboration as if we don't get it right now. Um, AI could like completely um, act uh, uh, in an uncontrolled manner and uh, without human oversight. That this means uh, instead of just solving problems and reaching into you know, uh, 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 solutions or suggestions, and being complementary, it could also um, take decisions and implement them in an automated way and with a deep learning to a point where we don't understand uh, why it reached us such a conclusion and why um, the decision has been taken. Um, so I do believe it, um, it's a very important uh, technology and of course the convergence with other technologies uh, um, is, is going to be uh, revolutionary. Um, I understand we, we don't even talk about the possibility of the metaverse because for me it was like it started like a gaming, but I see it could actually um, uh, also bring new challenges. Um, in the AI Act, I believe it would be the basis for all these emerging technologies. Um, the, the two core elements that I think we need to, to understand is that um, uh, we're going to have an index uh, to escalate the legal and technical obligations for the systems. And uh, um, this means if it's harmful, uh, it would have to face more obligations um, in terms of uh, health, uh, safety, or fundamental human rights. And um, of course, as, as you know, there's been a lot of discussions around it, unacceptable risks uh, would be completely banned without exception. Options. And this is where we need to clarify uh, subliminal manipulation, um, social scoring by public authorities, what happens if it's private authorities, uh, real-time remote biometric identification in public spaces, because, you know, when you start to have exceptions for law enforcement, then exceptions could um, also um, uh, bring more risks. And then we have the high-risk applications, which I think would uh, be more easy to identify because they 
then you allow uh, special features and uh, you, you put more restrictions. Um, you have, of course, exander uh, ex requirements for data training, validation, and, um, and testing. And risk management measures uh, you require more transparency and human oversight. I know in the UK, um, human oversight is not essential, but in Europe it remains essential. Um, and um, I mean, it's easy to, to tell that um, in the UK, I think this is an example, because I think with the example we understand what are the challenges. Um, they had like an automated system with AI that would grade students, and it took under consideration the past achievements or background and basically it replicated the biases uh, that coming from a poorer background or like non uh, uh, non achievers they were uh, by the code um, being let's say downgraded and the failure um, arrived and reached even even the office of of, um, of Johnson and his response was to blame the algorithm. So um, we don't want to uh, blame the algorithm. In Europe, we want to take uh, full responsibility of, of how we use it. We need to understand the liabilities and we need to understand um, and avoid the risk, the potential risk. Um, the, the good thing, because I don't want to talk only about the problems we're going to face, is that the limited, the minimal risk applications are actually most of them out there. So um, most AI systems in the market, they can operate largely freely and uh, would not have the burden of such obli obligations. Um, of course, with, uh, with uh, AI systems like chatbots that can um, confuse people, then we have some obligations of um, um, making users aware that they are talking to chatbots. Um, I think deepfakes is, uh, is something that we have to uh, pay attention to. And uh, anyway, the second element that I wanted to mention is the um, High-risk AI systems that they um, um, must meet specific obligations in Europe and outside of Europe, coming to Europe uh, in order to be allowed in the European market. I think this is our way of saying that we want basically to to follow the example of the GDPR. So we want to ensure that um, we will definitely have a level playing field in Europe, and uh, um, and these requirements will be. Um, um, accepted also by, as I said, non-like-minded countries because AI is a, is a um, technology that goes beyond our, our borders, of course. And it's very important to understand how and where the data were trained and, and to understand that they will not, again, uh, repeat biases um, that could come up uh, from the uh, training. Um, I think these two elements, like the index, maybe the pyramid of, uh, um, of risk and then the uh, requirements for the high-risk AI systems, they are already enough for us. I mean, uh, biometrics, face recognition, when, where, and how um, can be used, and then how to collect the data and, and how people should be aware and not manipulate it. Which, for example, could include targeted advertisement. Is it considered to be sub subliminal manipulation? What are like these, these lines that we need to um, uh, draw? Uh, because they are quite blurry now. Um, I, I, I can just say Cambridge Analytica. It was like targeted, um, but it could have actually changed the core of our, our European history. Um, so I think uh, we need to reflect whether it's um, necessary to um, prohibit or to allow um, uh, these high risk and, and uh, um, unacceptable risks. And um, I think also we need to, um, to be very positive to see how we can embrace and enhance the use of AI in order to um, complement our work, to make a more fair environment, to take um, advantage of all the achievements that AI can bring. And uh, of course, um, AI could, could help us be more fair and, and to improve our, our conditions, to actually bring the solutions for the pandemic and um, help us with uh, the systems that we can use to respond to challenges of supply chain, to like of the new challenges we have by, by um, uh, the war conflict in, uh, in Ukraine, for example, where um, they can use systems to, uh, to understand this information, they can stop attacks, they can follow the money to, to ensure that the sanctions will take place. Um, so there are several ways to use um, AI. Um, I think what's most important today, actually, is what um, Rosandinos Carajales has been working on, 
and um, I think this is also the core of this discussion. So um, I, I believe I should like now um, uh, listen to the rest of the um, conversation because the ethics certification program that is developed by the IEEE and his leadership and its application to uh, concrete use cases like the city of Vienna have been uh, extremely important with uh, uh, an incredible foresight as it really identifies the power that now lays in the hands of the developers. Um, and I, I do think that uh, this is essential for them and for us to understand. They can embed by design an ethical code, no matter what we do or we ask for. Several colleagues don't even know if it's technically possible, but they can also um, have a code of contact that would not allow anybody to go beyond like um, uh, be, beyond what I mentioned as our uh, lines for, for an ethical use of AI. So um, thank you and uh, congratulations for all your efforts to raise awareness of uh, AI for people and AI for good when nobody else did. Thank you very much, Eva. I know you have to leave us, but if I may just ask one question, because you mentioned the level playing field and so did uh, Salvatore Scalzo from DG Connect and the Commission. And I think this theme uh, this afternoon is around I suppose the question I'm asking is whether in the Parliament you've been discussing how to assure also mutual accreditation of process, mutual assurance to encourage the IEEE, Fujitsu, and all the people trying to do the right thing around the world can strive together to get acknowledgement by the European legislator so that the level playing field is also a two-way street, if I can put it that way. And over just, just a very short answer here. So we are now um, dealing with the AI Act, uh, but we do have um, a standard for AI where we are uh, uh, ex extending and expanding our, our network in order to not duplicate, but not to overlap and to ensure that there will be um, uh, the perfect collaboration with at least like-minded countries, as I said. So we work with IEEE, with OECD, we try to have UN on board, and um, uh, nevertheless, we have TTC um, uh, taking place, the transatlantic bridges that would discuss like all the technological developments and ensure we will uh, follow the same uh, um, guidelines. Um, again, though, um, this would be uh, there would be a board that would control it. We want to have monitoring through the whole life cycle. So these things will come um, in place. Uh, there is an observatory for um, several legislative work, works that are taking place in different uh, parliaments from the OECD. And we want to reach the point where we will agree in the common standards, but then also um, on, on uh, specific methodologies to um, identify the high and the unacceptable risks. Uh, but we are not there yet. I have to say we still have a long way to go. Uh, but of course, uh, this is a technology that we cannot be stopped by borders. So we definitely have to uh, to understand where we can compromise and where we, we shouldn't. Um, so it, it's an ongoing process. And this means we need to keep having like this kind of discussions to learn from each other and to see how we can uh, um, achieve maximum protection of our lives and the, the benefits we have uh, from AI, in order, but also to avoid the, um, the risks that are unnecessary to take by the use of this technology. Um, so I, I think it's a unique opportunity with the work of, uh, of Mr. Karajalos to set a global benchmark too. And uh, um, um, at, at least I, I believe the vision we all have is to um, uh, respond to your question in a way that it would be more positive and we say yes we managed to achieve that but yes we we know that we have to achieve that yeah yeah i think that's that's very encouraging and as you were saying there's a lot more global focus on ai ethics at the moment of your legislation than when we were doing gdpr where people thought what's your rebut to and then they caught up i think i think that we're in a good place thank you very much uh, and now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to pass back to the uh, the IEEE uh, the triangle, as I as I put it, and to pass the floor to Ali Hassami, um, who will pick up the narrative that uh, Konstantinos has begun. Ali, you have the floor. Thank you, Robert. <clears throat> um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is an absolute pleasure to share some of the work we've been doing at IEEE with yourselves. Um, 
and in a sense underpin some of the messages uh, put forward earlier by Eva and Constantinos and uh, other colleagues. Uh, when we look at technology ethics generally and AI being uh, in the forefront of these for the time being, there are very many generic common themes that emerged. These are not context specific, they are so-called horizontal considerations, horizontal views of where ethics is intersecting with the interaction of technology with humanity. We, we generally hear about concerns over uh, measures of bias that may creep into decision-making uh, due to autonomous nature of most AI system, as well as fairness. We hear uh, people's concerns about explainability of decisions made by autonomous systems and measures of transparency in terms of the whole process of design development, deployment, and being able to communicate and make accessible records and communicate uh, decisions as well as fundamental facets of design and development. We hear matters of accountability and responsibility and technically also where the legal uh, line for assuming responsibility for what may come and what may go wrong lie in the context of application. Of course, the likes of GDPR have always been uh, uh, welcome here, a uh, European pace setter, if you like, for respect for privacy, but it, it tackles the, if you like, the data and uh, legal dimension, and I'll cover the ethical dimension of privacy as well, which is hugely complementary to what GDPR does. Then there are old fashioned concerns about safety and security, generally under the title of uh, technical dependability and integrity, uh, resilience, uh, reliability, and that kind of thing. These are generally, uh, even though they fall under the uh, ethical considerations, they have been around for a long time. And in fact, most of the existing legal protections and regulations relate to safety. In fact, after 2000 years of civilization, more or less that's what we have, safety regulations, which prevents uh, uncontrolled harm to member of the public or any, <clears throat> stakeholder by any vendor and service provider. The, the final facet which relates to the way we manage the whole uh, episode of design development and service provision or product the provision is that of uh, responsible governance. In the past, we have dealt with corporate social responsibility, but when it comes to autonomy and machine decision making, we are talking about a whole new game. This is no longer about good neighborly behaviors by commercial enterprises. So bearing these broad areas of common themes that appear irrespective of context uh, of application, IEEE as uh, Constantinos has already covered, embarked on a global initiative it went in multiple directions. We have published ethically aligned design treaties um, three years ago. Uh, we started a series of standards specifically addressing um, AI and ethical dimensions. Uh, I had the absolute pleasure of leading the work on the core standard called 7000. Uh, and that standard was published last year. And this is the first global standard which provides people with a process, a model process, how to address ethical concerns when they are designing autonomous intelligence systems. And you can see the other members of the 7,000 family, some in um, the highlighted ones are those which are already published and accessible for consultation. The others have been in development for 
uh, quite a few years just to give you a flavor of what it takes to develop these standards. The 7000 standard was actually produced, uh, initiated <clears throat> in 2016 and uh, took well over five years to achieve. To some extent, it shows the complexity and the nature of multidimensionality of addressing issues of ethics in technology. Shamefully, we haven't been doing these for hundreds of years and AI has brought us to our senses and frankly, hats off to those uh, such as Constantinos who saw this coming and the necessity for looking at the socio-technical systems and the encroachment of autonomy on our agency and privacy damage. Anyway, so that's a quick overview of the standards in the making with the highlighted ones already available for consultation. Um, and the second component of our work is largely about certification. This is a hugely complementary initiative to what we talked about in terms of standards. One other uh, feature of this certification process, at least the way we have gone about it, is the agile nature of this process. Standards take inordinate lengths of time, typically two, three years, and maximum five years. I have been involved in even Senelec European standardization since late 90s. Hardly any standard finished less than three years. And the worst case, I, my experience of a European software safety standard took five years. So we are talking about a whole new uh, challenge in the space of regulation and understanding of the social impact. And we cannot wait for consensus to arrive through expert dialogue and word mongering and fighting over shall and should and statements and so on. So the initiative uh, so-called ethics certification program for autonomous intelligence systems uh, was initiated uh, late 2018, in fact, November 2018, and it was commenced uh, around early 2019 with the objective of going for those horizontal generics uh, and trying to characterize these. What does it mean to claim uh, a, a product system or an organization is transparent? What does it mean to be accountable and responsible? How do you know some product or service is free from unacceptable uh, degrees of data or algorithmic bias? How do we know we have sufficient respect for ethics, ethical privacy, not legal privacy in the sense of GDPR and the uh, data subject and who has access to our data. We're talking about respect for the soul of the human being and in a sense for their dignity. And finally, Having started back in 2019, we set ourselves a very tough task. We said we need a, a more agile process. We want this process to be also complementary to the work that we do in narrative-based standardization. So we adopted a model-based approach to development. And by now, we have completed suites of criteria which characterize the ethics of transparency, accountability, existence of bias, and ethics of privacy. The final one that uh, I have referred to as a responsible governance or ethical governance is in the final stages of being completed. So by the time we probably uh, launch this program in a few months' time globally, we would have. Uh, at least four, if not five, uh, fairly comprehensive suites of criteria, which as hi uh, highlighted by Constantinos, are not ch check boxes uh, and binary uh, questions in terms of yes and no. They are measurable uh, exam questions for, and it is fundamental also, we've heard this both from Salvatore as well as Eva, that we need to be proportionate we need to more or less uh, have a sense of fairness in the process, both for conformity assessment, as well as for delivery of social responsibility. So the more harm, the more scrutiny. That's exactly the architecture of our criteria. Uh, 
And uh, to finish off, because we have uh, little time to elaborate, but we can answer any specific questions arising in the Q&A time, these five suites of horizontal generic criteria that we have developed are, if you like, application agnostic in the sense that we have just universally characterized them in terms of when we talk about bias that could come from algorithm, could come from data specification and classification, could come from even deployment aspects, how do these <clears throat> translate into a specific. So that's the second architectural aspect of our offering uh, through IEEE, the work that we have done, and that is uh, quit, quick profiling. So any sector specific application relating to any of these five can be produced very uh, efficiently in an agile manner um, that no standardization process can handle. We are talking about weeks rather than years, so to speak here. So we have got uh, potential what we call sector or application profiling, and that applies to all of our horizontal suites and the profiles would be a bespoke, customized, and if you like fit for purpose version of these universal generic stuff. That's the architecture that we have built into our uh, uh, criteria for certification and the system is supported also by a training program and believe it or not, even a competency program that uh, is going to be rolled out by the middle of 2022. I know time is uh, of the essence and our colleague uh, Clara would cover the uh, more uh, European and the rest of the perspectives of where our approach and our <clears throat> philosophies uh, fit in the application context. So I stop at this point and leave the rest to uh, Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe just before I pass to Clara, if I can ask one question, Ali, since you're the, 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 the architect expert, as far as I understand it. How does all this fit with what uh, we were hearing from Fujitsu about cultural or geographical or legal system customization? Is that, a, is that also a step that the IEEE process has um, incorporated? Well, the, the final slide that I shared um, is not just about profiling our generic criteria for a specific application in health or uh, transport or financial services. It is also about uh, customization of any one of these for a given legal, cultural, uh, contextual system, even if it is uh, from, I don't know, uh, Ubuntu to Confucian culture, uh, what is their interpretation of transparency or accountability, et cetera. So customization is built into our architecture uh, on a very efficient and agile basis because there is going to be a huge variability here and it's virtually impossible to go and produce everything that the universe creates and needs uh, in the context of AI as an evolving, uh, challenging technology. So we have built it into architecture. And as I said, it's hugely dynamic and agile and can generate results in weeks for a specific, even cultural set of values. Well, that's great. That's great. We're, we're way beyond Henry Ford that we can all have it any color as long as it's black. Clara, I'd like now to pass the floor to you to, to pick up what your two colleagues have said and a uh, European specific story from you, please, Clara. Thank you, Robert, and thank you for having me here. Uh, so my name is Clara Neppel. I'm uh, the senior director of IEEE in Europe. Uh, we are based uh, in Vienna. And uh, our two main focus areas are actually public policy and standards. So we are engaged with the uh, European uh, Commission, but also with the OECD and the Council of Europe and, and other international organizations. Uh, now, after having heard so many uh, important points on a generic level, what is important uh, for a certification. I would like to um, come up here with a very concrete example, um, a certification use case that we did with the city of Vienna. 
and also maybe to give some um, insight why organizations or cities might be interested in, in these kind of instruments. Um, so, um, first of all, I would like to start that the city of Vienna, just as many other cities, I think Paris, uh, Barcelona, uh, come to my mind, are really deeply uh, caring about providing uh, trustworthy and uh, high quality services to their uh, citizens. And I say this because um, of some of uh, very inspiring uh, uh, discussions I had maybe with the city uh, authorities. So the city of Vienna told me that they see this in a very similar way um, as uh, they were confronted more than 150 years ago when the city was, um, was growing very quickly. So there was a challenge to provide uh, clean water to their citizens. So uh, they went to the Alps and they, um, uh, they, they were building a pipeline to, to bring spring water to, uh, to the citizens, but that was not enough. They actually bought uh, the piece of land and uh, they are managing that piece of land since in order to have the right mix of, um, um, of the vegetation, which would ensure the high quality of the water since. And as a matter of fact, in Vienna, if you come, you will see that one of the most uh, <laughs> best quality in the world of the water. So in an analog way, they say they would like to provide an infrastructure for digital services uh, that would also be equally sustainable. And uh, they also started uh, an initiative which is called Digital Humanists. And uh, basically it brings together academia and, uh, and industry and also as professional associations, we are part of it as well. And certification is seen really as one of the instruments uh, of providing trust, of, of showing trust uh, also uh, towards the citizens. So um, let's go to the concrete use case. It's, uh, it's the Wiener Stadtwerk, as a matter of fact, which is a subsidiary of the city of Vienna, uh, which, is, uh, which is in charge of providing services in um, such, such as energy or public transport or parking to the citizens. And since it has 15,000 employees and I think 3 billion um, Euro turnover, it's actually also one of the largest companies, if you want so, in, in Austria. Uh, so uh, the Wiener Stadtwerke receives more than 1,000 emails a day. And of course, it's important to categorize those uh, emails to, uh, to the teams that are processing those emails. Uh, now, you can imagine that uh, a human uh, that was doing this task, or this is a very tiresome and monotonous task. So it was decided to, uh, to automate uh, this, this task and also to use it as a first uh, use case for the certification. So uh, uh, there was an international board of experts led by Ali. And I would also like to give credit to Dietmar Schabus, who is uh, the uh, project leader from the Wiener Stadtwerke. And I, there, there were basically five steps. So the, so the first steps was really to understand the context. I think that we, um, we heard now very clearly that uh, when we talk about AI systems, you have to understand this, the context, because even if you have a, an AI system which works well in a, in a lab on a, on a given context, it, this uh, behavior, the output can change if you, use the, if you change the context. And here it was important to understand also not only the system architecture, but also the stakeholders, uh, such as the citizens, but also the internal stakeholders. So the, the employees of the Wiener Stadtwerke, how are they impacted by the AI system? And also the indirect stakeholders. So maybe the, even those who are not using the services, if we are thinking of, about uh, social media, I might not use a social media, but I might be indirectly affected in terms of democracy if I'm using that AI system. So that is after this first step was concluded, the second was really to, uh, to assess the risk. So uh, we heard from Ali uh, that uh, the criteria, the, the, the uh, subset of the criteria should be proportional to the risk assessment. And uh, here uh, basically it was uh, look to what extent um, ethical values such as non-discrimination or uh, transparency might be undermined by the system. Now this particular system was found to be a low risk uh, application and from the hundreds of uh, criteria only, 43 uh, were, um, were chosen uh, to be evaluated by the panel of experts. Uh, and some of these criteria were technical criteria and other were more organizational ones. So such as hyperparameter tuning or how to treat false positives, but also uh, human oversight. 
And uh, after that, uh, it was of course important to see with which form uh, the, uh, the, the claims uh, are, are submitted. And this was also important to submit it in a standardized form. Uh, so basically that uh, any certification body uh, can, can assess it in a, in a similar way. Um, well, uh, it was a happy end. Uh, the, the criteria were found to be sufficient, but it was also important uh, to give them um, a, a adequate response, so adequate uh, comments on what could be even improved. And um, well, we had a very nice ceremony at the city hall in November, but I think what is important maybe also here is just uh, some of the, the lessons learned. And the lessons were what it found. It was found that, of course, um, it is a lengthy process. It was also our first uh, proof of concept, but it, it was found to be proportionate. Actually, they said uh, they would have been very uh, surprised if we would say uh, just in a few days we have conducted the certification. Uh, secondly, they also said that um, what was important to them is that it's just the first uh, step in a long journey. Actually, they see certification uh, as an important way, not only for AI services that, that they're developing, but also for procurement purposes. And I think procurement is really one of the uh, most important use cases for certification. And last but not least, I think that what was uh, being, being seen very positively is uh, this um, external um, assessment, also in terms of skills, because it was very clear that these skills in terms of how to do ethical certification was very difficult to find and also to find the, um, the common language, let's say, and the translation between technical requirements and ethical uh, requirements. So um, I think that uh, with this, I would like to conclude, um, as I said, my, my uh, purpose for here was to give a very concrete example that I hope uh, would be a, a good basis for further discussions. Thank you. Oh, that's very interesting, Jack. Thank you very much. And, and when you say it was lengthy, but not disproportionately so, how many weeks or months? Yes, so uh, the... Um, uh, it was also COVID, uh, we have to say. So um, we cannot really say uh, the, the project was, I would say, over one year. But as I said, it was, it, we had a project uh, manager who was also had to do other things. Uh, so it is difficult to say. I can just say maybe that uh, the case for ethics. So uh, the submission which was done uh, eventually comprised 150 pages of, of material, which were technical documentation, um, screenshots. Uh, so uh, it was also a low, low risk application. So we did not go, let's say there and, and provided uh, our own tests or anything like that. And again, just as uh, Constantino said, the way this uh, certification is going to be done uh, will be also determined by the certification body. So in this case, uh, this, this kind of evidence was seen as being sufficient. Yeah, well, that's very clear, but it's, it is very helpful, I think, for a discussion such as this to, to listen and think about how it might work in practice. Good. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, these are the presentations we had on the program, and we have half an hour or so now for conversation, and I really want to emphasize conversation, not just questions and answers. I, I'd like first to invite Raja, you who were very modest and short at the beginning, maybe to give a first response to what we've heard and, and especially the interaction between the work that's going on, whether at IEEE or Fujitsu level on the one hand, the legislative process and everybody hopes it will fit together and be synergetic, but how does it seem from where you're sitting, bearing in mind also that you're uh, sitting in capital of currently the European presidency of the Council of Ministers. So the French angle has a particular relevance at this time. Roger. Thank you, Robert. You're so kind. Of course, I don't represent the French government here, so I cannot say that I have any anything to say about that. Um, I think uh, uh, what we are discussing is a multi-stakeholder issue. And everyone's contribution is, is important and converging to uh, common objectives. Currently, the uh, AI Act is undergoing uh, consultations and I see this as part of uh, this discussion and, and uh, 
helping us to better understand what is at stake through concrete examples, concrete work. Uh, the AI Act is uh, a framework. Uh, the stakeholders, industry, uh, those who develop the systems, those who use them, the uh, uh, institutions who will uh, uh, employ them uh, have uh, a say and, and have also uh, experience to share. And this is how I see what's, what's happening today. Uh, all what we, we have heard, and, and thank you all the speakers about uh, your very valuable contributions, uh, help us better frame, better understand what is meant by uh, certification. Uh, how can this uh, process be actually achieved through concrete examples? Uh, and this is what we need. I mean, the, the, the uh, uh, important thing is concrete cases, concrete examples, and not just general uh, opinions or general uh, presentations. Um, I, I see uh, um, uh, looking at, at what Fujitsu is doing, uh, uh, this is very valuable because here we have uh, an, an industry who is strongly involved and uh, actually trying to precede the legislative uh, obligations. Uh, and that's really important uh, because uh, uh, it is with uh, such uh, a, um, uh, an approach that, that we can actually uh, understand where this uh, process is going to go. Uh, I've, I've heard that, for example, uh, we have uh, in the AI Act, we don't have an a legislation about AI. It, uh, it's about the use cases uh, according to their risk level. Uh, and, and therefore what we need is to identify these risk levels and to come up with approaches that address them specifically. And this is what I've seen uh, here. Uh, I've seen also that the uh, uh, approach taken by the IEEE is quite uh, global. I mean, it, it has a, a, a perception of the uh, um, different component of the uh, certification issue uh, based on ethical uh, design, based on the uh, um, uh, requirements that uh, actually we have discussed in the European Dialogue Expert Group and which uh, inspired the AI Act, uh, the requirements for an ethical uh, certification. So for me, these are concrete uh, examples, concrete contributions, more than examples actually, because they have been pushed very, very thoroughly uh, to inspire how we can achieve uh, the uh, concrete uh, um, solutions for, for this certification issue, which is really and clearly very important. Uh, some additional things I believe uh, uh, could be addressed. Uh, it's, uh, and specifically the work on, uh, I think the, this notion of risk, because the risk today, in, as, as I see it in the AI Act, is related to the application domains. Uh, however, risk has uh, a uh, multi-dimensional uh, uh, um, feature actually. Even if you consider that the application domain do not a priori uh, present some risks, you might have very risky situations. Uh, I just take one example. Uh, who, would, who would have thought, for example, that social media 10 years ago would be something that presents high risk uh, issues, risk, very high risk issues related to democracy, for example, to related to manipulation, et cetera. Whereas such applications can be considered as uh, not presenting specifically high risk and would be completely uh, under the radar uh, for the, uh, for the uh, legislation. So, uh, I think uh, uh, an important work would be to uh, clarify what is risk, how we can assess it, taking into account all these uh, dimensions and, and uh, of course, coming up with uh, uh, approaches to uh, 
uh, not just assess it, but also uh, to, again, certify the obligations in, uh, or, or the systems, uh, sorry, uh, rated to, to this risk. Thank you, Robert. Thank you very much, Raja. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, if you wish to ask some questions, click on the raise hand button at the bottom of the page, and then I will see that you have comments. Um, while I wait to see raised hands, I want to take what Raja has said and turn to you, Salvatore. Um, I'm obsessed with the international coherence of our approach. So we have an emergent global technical, technological reality, and we have the EU as a jurisdiction, and we have IEEE as a, as a, a standards-making entity. Do you feel, listening to this conversation, that the Act, as it is emerging, provides a sufficiently clear framework for those sort of self-certified products to actually get the recognition that the level playing field implies? I mean, are we are we having a coherent conversation or are we hearing about standards which and certification processes which risk being almost a, on the wrong plane to be incorporated within the forthcoming act and to the extent there are issues of fit how do you at which stage of your process from now till 2025 entry into force will there be opportunities to make it work? Because I think that's genuinely where we now are. I, I, I dare not seek to estimate the amount of social capital created by the IEEE network, by what companies like Fujitsu are doing. And the opportunity to leverage all of that is huge, but only if the legislative process creates that right framework. So obviously, you know, you'll say that's a very big question and why do I put the spotlight on you, but this is a very Chatham Housey discussion. Nobody's going to hold you or your commissioner to it, but does it work? Will these, will these nice processes fit into the nice law or are the two going to sort of go past each other? Thank you. Uh, but certainly it's not uh, an easy question to, 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 to reply comprehensively. Uh, there are, though, maybe a couple of observations that I, 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 I could make. Um, I would say that the, the EU, it has been said during this discussion, that the, the AI Act builds uh, on, uh, let's say, uh, long-time efforts of the Commission, which started already in, in 2018 with regard to artificial intelligence, and which were... Uh, I would say substantially nurtured by the international discussions around AI. So in that respect, I truly believe that the concepts, uh, uh, if we look at the, I mean, I already pointed, for example, that our definition builds on the OECD one with really a few differences, uh, but in general, I would say the terminology, the technical areas which underpin our requirements, uh, in my view, overall, and I think this has been confirmed also today by by the IEEE colleagues uh, are, let's say, find the consensus of the community on AI. That those are certainly the technical areas that could uh, concur to define what uh, we uh, have in mind as trustworthy artificial intelligence. So in that sense, I'm confident that there is a general consensus regarding the areas uh, uh, underpinning our requirements, also the kind of uh, definition of, of AI and the terminology which we have tried to use. This is on the regulatory side. Now, of course, the devil will be in the detail, clearly, no? because uh, as I said, uh, we, uh, we have now a regulatory framework, but the framework refers, uh, as I've tried to explain, uh, to high-level technical objectives that must be achieved by the AI applications and solutions, meaning that the standards will play a key role in, uh, uh, let's say, defining the actual and detailed technical solutions that uh, will in concrete operationalize our requirements and will, which will be used by the operators to prove and demonstrate that their, uh, their system is a trustworthy one in the meaning of the regulation and is compliant with the requirements of the regulation. So there, I think we have a challenge. Uh, uh, we have a challenge for us, but I would say for the standardization community as a whole, 
as I've tried to explain, we have a system that tries to make a, an appropriate bridge between European and international standardization, which is the system of harmonized standards. But I think, and I talk for the Commission side, of course, uh, uh, on the Commission side, we have also a, um, an additional uh, responsibility, which is to facilitate, as you, as you correctly said, to facilitate that all the different relevant efforts, and I think today we have probably the, one of the most notable examples, uh, like IEEE, can, uh, let's say, concur to define the future technical solutions which will be relevant also for the AI framework. So in that sense, I feel that we have, uh, and we are trying really to do our best in that respect, really to facilitate this cooperation between the different standardization community and making sure that we can rely on the work that they have done and also that we can bring the solutions that have been already adopted because we won't even have the time to build uh, so many new ones. And, uh, and I think today we have listened you know, to work which has been ongoing for some years. So of course, I feel that we have the need to rely on that notably when it is uh, relevant and of high quality. So we will have also ourselves, I think we plan to facilitate this discussion and the integration of all the relevant technical technical contents. Uh, the colleagues also here from IEEE, I'm happy for that because we have tried also to engage with our colleagues from the Joint Research Center that help DigiConnect to, let's say, drive the overall standardization work in the field, uh, in the field of AI. And uh, we are really now in a strong uh, coordination and cooperation to see also from the Commission side, we are conducting a more in-depth analysis uh, of IEEE standards also to make sure to see and agree with the colleagues together, how those contents could be appropriately used also for the purpose of the, of the EU requirements. So I think uh, that uh, we have a challenge there, but we are doing, we, our objective is clear and we're trying already, we have engaged as necessary to make sure that we can be up for this challenge. Yeah. So I think I, I don't want to monopolize the debate and I, I, I would like to ask Konstantinos to, to, to contribute as well after this, but it's clear to me from what you and whatever have said that the will politically with the legislator and so on is to find a solution that progressively creates among the like-minded a consistent framework. If, if I may comment as a sort of retired legislator, um, the danger is that the engineering in, allows failure if deadlines are missed. And surely we need somewhere, and this is almost a drafting idea, to provide that during the transitional phase and until the Commission says, okay, now we have all the pieces in place and so everything has to be according to this set of rules, during that transition phase, which won't be over by 25, uh, almost a list of standards and processes of good standing will be an acceptable alternative. Because otherwise you have a sort of legal vacuum where people are taking corporate and regulatory risk across the world because we're all waiting for the best standard but it hasn't yet emerged and i think some sort of evolutive clause is really really important because otherwise we'll be in a, a highly dangerous uh, situation it seems to me but i think um I, I, this is probably beyond our pay grades, but I would really encourage those no, who are no, no, putting okay. pen to paper to think about it. I was having a conversation in a similar field with one of your colleagues on the sandbox provision, which is brilliant. But of course, we don't yet have, we're, we're several years behind in terms of defining sandboxes for AI. So it's great that there's going to be scope for that sort of contribution to safe AI in the act, but um, how do we get from the vision to the reality? I think there's a there's an interesting point there, and it's still time to um, make sure that we have a future proofing, including during implementation. I I, I now do see a few hands raised. I wanted um, therefore first to go to Constantinos because you had made a comment which was even more down to earth in the chat saying. It's actually about training and accreditating assessors who can use these tools. So the problem is not even uh, Westphalian coherence of regulators, which was my piece. It's more 
making sure that when somebody self-certifies to a standard, you know that it's properly done. Um, would you like to elaborate a bit on that, Constantinos? And then I'd like to pass to Paul Donga, who's asked for the floor. Yes, uh, no, very, very briefly, Robert, thank you. Uh, of course, the challenges and the problems are different. Uh, with regard to the level of maturity of the different approaches and tools and so on. Eh? Of course, uh, I mean, it is uh, almost a tautology to say that uh, we have to uh, take into account different, uh, let's say, uh, perspectives and stakeholders and so on. But I assume that um, most are doing this. So the way we're, where we are now, it is we have quite mature tools. But, uh, and there is a market. We receive a lot of demands. Uh, but this is, a, a, let's say, a very delicate dance. Uh, who does what exactly here? Uh, what are the skills that are necessary to do this? And this will take a little time. Uh, it is, uh, we have developed the specifications, and perhaps they are not perfect, but they are a very good start, I must say. It is not just this, uh, the ECPIs or the certified, it is also the standards we have created. And uh, these standards also, they need the conformity assessment suites. When can you uh, demonstrate, how can you demonstrate you abide with these standards uh, beyond saying, I, I do it? Yeah. So we're working at these fronts. But in the, in the same time, we're working to, with people because we have to develop the skills of the people. And we're doing this in parallel. And this takes time hmm? because they have to understand the depth of what has been produced and the breadth and the, how it can be adapted. And, uh, and um, yes, and we have a plan for this. And uh, there is also a, a role distribution, as I have alluded in my first comment, that uh, uh, it should be not probably the same organization who develops the specifications, does the assessment, and uh, issues the certification. Hmm. And there are organizations that are doing this. It is not uh, impossible. I know, for instance, big organizations like UL or TÜV in Germany, they, they do this. Hmm. Uh, but what we would prefer to see is a distribution of tasks because it is uh, not only it is more um, controllable, the process, and more transparent and open. Also, it is more scalable because if one really does everything, then the, the, let's say there is a, a bottleneck there that uh, may, may hinder the, the, let's say, the replication. So uh, we believe that, uh, so we know, and we're doing this already, that uh, there will be many organizations that are capable of taking the specifications that have been produced by us and by others and uh, use them to assess the quality of systems for their clients. This is the professional organization, be the big consultancies, but also other organizations. So it can be also small and medium scale. And here there is a chance also for small and medium scale organizations, also in Europe. You do not need to be a giant. You just need uh, three, four people who understand this, and then you can do it. You must not be the KPMG and so on. Eh? So the, this is an opportunity that opens also for organizations in Europe that understand this and want to do this. There are many ambitions out there, but uh, these people need to be trained, and uh, there must be also a system for um, uh, accrediting them. Eh? How do we know they can do this and so on? And who does this? And uh, there are several ways we can approach it, perhaps not so bureaucratic and centralized, but still we need some quality assurance there also for the people that get involved. Yeah. I agree, accreditation, whether it's self-certification, so Fujitsu, we trust Fujitsu because it's a big company, but there may be quite small companies doing quite edgy things in AI. Do they have the same governance capacity? And then if they say, well, we don't, but we ask the man in the corner shop, is that all right? And I, I perceive already that the, the SMEs can do it. The risk is that they want to do the end-to-end -end solution. They don't want to have an arm's length relationship between assurance and certification. So I think that you raised some very important issues. Paul, you were the next to ask for the floor. Yeah, th thank you, Robert. Um, I guess I want to maybe touch on uh, some of the points that Constantinos raised as well, but 
but but also to touch on a separate point, and, and that's something that we're keen on. So how do we educate organizations to understand what ethics really means? Um, some of the organizations I talk with, they, they, they look at you in puzzlement. So, look, you know, we're, we're an IT company, we just build IT systems that do good things. And, and th that's it's quite a simplistic view, but actually it's the prevailing view. There are a few of the very big technology companies that really understand, if you like, the ethical issues around AI. And they're the ones that have been in the press. But, but, but your, your average organization that just wants to develop good systems and has a good business model actually doesn't really understand what it means when we talk about ethical principles. So I think that's one of the challenges that, that, that we face. And this related to that is the development of what we call machine learning ops, which is how do you get organizations to embed ethical principles within the requirements capture and the development pipeline right the way through tests and so on and so forth. So how do organizations change so that you don't have to rely solely on a certification authority that sits outside of an organization at some arm's length to then tell that organization, not actually, we've now looked at what you've done and you've fallen short. Is there a way to get organizations to, if you like, preempt some of those discussions and actually take the onus to ensure that what they are doing is, is, is ethically sound? So, you know, that relates to some of the, the, the points I mentioned on my slide about governance. So how do organizations have to change their structure, their governance structure, their forums, their risk committees to produce the artifacts that demonstrate to the, to the right committee chair that they are following ethical principles such that when a certification organization comes knocking on their door, they can present all of this good stuff and say, look, we really adhered to good practice. We, we understand good practice. We took a risk-based approach, if that's the prevailing view, and this is everything we did. So it's what we're concerned with is that as an organization that provides technology solutions to other technology companies that then face off to users is how, how we get them up the learning curve, how MLOps is, is uh, changed to be able to put ethical design at the heart of, of development. And, and I know from reading some of the, the, the ISO 7000 standards, they, they talk about starting this process early within system development life cycles. And I, we're a firm believer of that. So that's something that we would like to explore. Thank you. Clara? Yeah, I, uh, so I think uh, the example that I gave was actually already a system which, uh, which existed. So I think that we need to have instruments for both, uh, both for legacy systems as well as for newly developed systems. And I think that for new, newly developed systems, I think, Paul, that you're absolutely right that these values and, and ethical um, criteria should be taken into consideration already from the beginning. And uh, just to give you an example, uh, because uh, Robert also mentioned uh, that um, Sarah Spiekerman presented the 7000 standard, uh, which is also an IEEE standard for value-based engineering. Um, there is, uh, for instance, um, uh, an attempt, uh, and I think it's going to be a very interesting uh, attempt to integrate the design thinking um, methodology, which is already a very known methodology uh, to um, for, uh, for something which is called ethical design thinking. So including, if you want, so this ethical um, criteria and reaching out to the stakeholders from the very early urge before actually starting your uh, developing your systems um, and and also um, documenting all the um, all the decisions I think is going to be very important for anything that um, uh, that is going to be uh, used and later on also for the certification no thank you for that I, I really you know I support that view uh, entirely and and, and just thinking slightly further ahead, it's, and I think Raja mentioned it earlier, it's how, do, how does certification cope with AI systems that evolve over time? So an AI system that it's in, at its inception may not be categorized at high risk, but as the ML model trains and, and it sucks in biases and unfairness creeps into the system, and you know, we've seen that in social media, how do you then monitor and assess whether or not a system is, is getting out of hand for nefarious reasons or even accidental reasons? Um, that, that's something that, that I think we need to think about as a technology company as well and, and get other companies to start thinking about that. I think on that point, Paul, if I may say so, I mean, I was uh, very favorably impressed as a, somebody who follows this from a little distance by the 
the sort of cycle in the market that Salvatore's slides already speak to, you know, market surveillance, monitoring, reporting, reassessment, human oversight, sort of a sort of algo vigilance model. And it may well be that that, I mean, for a citizen to express themselves usefully on a, an AI failure, they need to be able to know it's an AI failure as opposed to I was redlined for my mortgage. But there are some problems like that. How do I know I need to tell the AI regulator? On the other hand, it seems to me that in that piece about breadth of oversight, the emerging uh, legislative model, at least that we've had presented today, gives you space for that. How you then make it real, well, that's a different question. Uh, I mean, how do you know when you when you fall sick, whether it was the restaurant you went to yesterday evening or your mother-in-law's omelette yesterday lunchtime? You know, we have these attribution problems, and I think they will affect AI as well. But the uh, I'm I, I would be fairly confident that some of that we're already getting ready for, and the whole pharmacovigilance model tells society how to do it. Um, making it a standardized approach is more difficult, automating it, which was one of the things we were talking about. Ali has asked for the floor. I must say that, ladies and gentlemen in the audience, you are no doubt taking copious notes, but if you, in five minutes, you'll be regretting that you didn't raise your hand because you had a question, it will be too late. Ali, you have the floor. Um, two points. One was as part of responsible governance, uh, as Constantinos referred to it. We've taken an ecosystem perspective on our work, not just here's a series of standards and leave it to the marketplace to do something with it, regulators or developers, so to speak. So as part of the ecosystem development, we've been thinking about certification, about competencies, about who are the key actors in the implementation side where the risk arises and not only developed a training program for those key players, we are also putting finishing touches to a competence framework for accrediting those people in the marketplace. We don't want a wild west scenario here that because suddenly AI and ethics are in good uh, in common parlance and suddenly very popular than anyone who can uh, access a copy of the standard can claim uh, they are good advisors or um, I don't know um, assessors for that matter. So we are actually putting some of the safeguards around ecosystem health monitoring and regulation in place for our own suite of uh, ethical criteria. And the, uh, <clears throat> I think that's uh, fundamentally uh, relevant to maintaining, if you like, the integrity of the whole ecosystem. We cannot just play a small part and walk away and say, we gave you the standard, you guys find how to interpret it, you guys find how to implemented and if you found a typing error come back to us otherwise we don't want to know that's uh, fundamentally the kind of a responsible governance attitude that uh, we have built into uh, our suite as well as we would we would like to practice what what we preach if you like so we took that upon ourselves that at least the ecosystem we are creating needs to have these characteristics and needs to be tightly monitored regulated and not left to decay. Uh, there was uh, another point on <coughs> uh, points that uh, were raised. Uh, I don't want to take the time. If there was space, I would uh, comment on the second issue as well. Yes, Ali, please do. Oh, um, <clears throat> I think it was. Uh, the point uh, raised by Clara uh, in so far as the, uh, the scope, I, I honestly feel it's um, virtually impossible to go and standardize the entirety of this uh, ecosystem. Uh, what we need is, um, as I have referred to, 
ability to be agile. We can't say uh, this law or that uh, regulation needs the 16 standards before it goes into play because there are uh, almost um, transformational nature of AI implies that there would be new applications, new innovations on the hoof as we speak. And we can't afford three years and five years before we have constructed a consensus-based uh, publication as a guide or a standard for that. So we really do need to, if you like, revisit how does uh, supporting infrastructure, including the technical standards and socio-technical criteria and measures have to be created. Uh, the old fashioned traditional approach of narrative based construction is uh, good and is uh, serve this purpose and very honorable, but it's inadequate. The final point that it just occurred to me on how do we know uh, what happens to an adaptive system such as AI? We have two models for certification. One model is for AI that can be largely assured in the classical uh, sense of control systems during design and development and testing and uh, this is how most safety certification systems work. You sufficiently test and use uh, the rest of the process in terms of secondary component of your assurance. What we also have in mind is dynamic nature of AI due to autonomy and algorithmic learning capacity. It would be virtually impossible to assure it two weeks after it's gone into deployment. And what is the virtue of giving it a certificate then? Uh, how do we know it's still ethical? How do we know it's still free from bias? How do we know it's still respecting privacy and hasn't developed appetite for taking, I don't know, underage uh, data or elderly data from its client base? So we have this secondary dimension of really thinking about uh, AI is one challenging technology that doesn't fit the old mold in terms of test as much as you can and then release it into use and more or less just observe it. This, this observation is reactive and insufficient safeguard for ethical assurance as a minimum, if not other dimensions of assurance. So, Again, taking a holistic and temporal basis, as well as a structural basis, we have all those elements that we do consider in our criteria during design development concept consultation with the stakeholders, but we don't lose sight of the fact that certification for AI is no longer the same as certifying an electric frying pan, which you just test in a laboratory and give a certificate of safety. We need to really move on in this discipline, accept the nature of the challenge, even if we don't have ready-made answers for it, but we need to be prepared for it. And that's part of our considerations of the future. Yeah, no, I agree, I agree. It's a bit like giving birth to babies. We hope they'll grow up to be good citizens Indeed. and bad citizens, and that's why you need the police. Um, but I mean, just perfectly well expressed. Salvatore, you have the last sort of 65 seconds and then I'll draw a few conclusions. Ah, okay. No, but I wanted just to react and then I will do really in, a, in a 30, 60 seconds uh, on two, three issues. Just to say, I very much appreciated the, the reference to flexibility so and, uh, and the life cycle, which is crucial in our framework. So. On flexibility, you will see that basically we have mechanisms in our uh, regulation to adapt uh, several elements uh, as a result of new evidence. So, and I'm referring notably to the definition, to high risk classification, and also to the nature of the conformity assessment. So, in that respect, uh, flexibility is indeed the key word. And from the life cycle, you 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 said it all, but it's very important. So, we have tried really to create there some new instruments, some building indeed also on concepts established in the medical sector to facilitate, I think what also Ali said is crucial, to facilitate a kind of active work also from the provider, not a reactive work, but an active work in collective evidence regarding the post-market phase, which I think uh, 
does not eliminate the risk, but attempts to minimize the risk, which in the end, uh, the, the kind of results we should aim at. So these are the two points I wanted to quickly react to, which I think are extremely important for AI. Thank you. So let me say just a few words, ladies and gentlemen, as we close. The first is uh, to thank Atomium for bringing us together, because I think that this has been uh, an extremely uh, stimulating debate. And if I may say so, one of the challenges we face is that the numbers of people who should be aware of what's going on and the, you know, the thousands of decision makers, even around the little Euro bubble, who have not had the benefit of these two hours discussion is huge. And the, the information deficit is one of the big problems in terms of this innovation cycle. People begin to understand that AI is a thing. They don't understand where the standards making and framing is going. They think a law is being made that's good, but they don't understand the complexity. And I think that there's a, a huge challenge, which we heard today, IEEE and I guess companies like Fujitsu, as well as the European institutions are, are all trying to tackle, which is how do we educate society to be proactive users of the system where we're developing, to understand what the standard means, to understand what the law means, to participate in the monitoring and assessment that Salvatore's drafting implies. So I think that there's a, all the work is going in the right direction, but there's a huge information deficit, which can threaten the reception of our product when it's ready, not just the AI product, but also the legislative product. And I think there's a need to uh, find new channels to, to multiply more the educational messages. I think it's, it's, a, it's an, another part of process architecture. Uh, Salvatore mentioned doctors. So medical schools should be telling people now um, what it means when they get AI in their clinic. And I'm not sure that's very widespread. So uh, I would say that information deficit is one um, challenge that I take away, and at the same time, a uh, huge admiration for the people who are not just doing the work, but communicating about it and met, creating ecosystems, which we've heard both uh, the company example and the IEEE example is very much part of building the tools that we need. The, the other piece I would repeat before I conclude is my own sort of global multilateral corporation goal, making sure that this level playing field, which both Salvatore and Eva uh, spoke to, is a genuinely two-way street, so that good tools, good processes, wherever they are created, will be shared globally and respected globally. And my third point is the sort of temporal dimension. The timetable, even as Salvatore describes it, is extremely challenging in terms of the legislative process and then also implies big challenges in terms of spreading the standards-based sector-specific culture-specific assurance system ready for 2025 so we and then i would conclude by saying on the temporal piece we have to make sure there isn't a hole in the middle of the bridge because it would be a tragedy with all the effort that's going on in tool making, regulatory framework making, if somehow the two bits in the bridge don't join, or that while we're waiting for the bridge to be completed, if I use that metaphor, we don't have a temporary structure, a consistent approach, so that like-minded countries and companies can get from here to a fully operational system without unintended um, obstacles to this crucial area of innovation, because that, that's always a risk. So I think that where we are is uh, extremely exciting. I think that thanks to the work of companies and organizations such as IEEE, the tools are going to be ready whether society is ready or it's a victim of information deficit, we don't know. And if societies around the world are really joined up, we're working on it, but we're also uh, in the middle of our efforts.
So I hope that the uh, Atomium AI for People process can contribute and continue to contribute to these important conversations and that we can get out of our conversations and, and bring it down to uh, citizens who also will need to understand this stuff and not see it as a as a scary black box. I'd like to congratulate therefore all the speakers and to thank the audience and to wish you all a happy end to your day and we will be continuing our work in this setting and I personally wish you great good luck in the work you're already doing because what we've heard today is really crucial. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.